Hello and welcome to the virtual recognition ceremony for the 22nd annual Holocaust Art and Writing Contest. I'm Marilyn Heron, Stern Chair in Holocaust Education and Director of the Rogers Center for Holocaust Education at Chapman University. A year ago, none of us could have predicted that today's recognition ceremony would once again be virtual and that we would be unable to gather in person. I am optimistic that next year we will be able to do so while continuing to welcome virtually those living at a distance from Chapman. This year's contest prompt on the theme, sharing strength, sustaining humanity, speaks both to the Holocaust and to the challenges we have faced over the last year. Mentored by their teachers, students listened to the testimonies of survivors and rescuers and responded to the prompt with knowledge and sensitivity. They recognized the differences between the era of the Holocaust and the challenges of our time. But the experiences of separation and isolation and in some cases, the loss of family and friends led students to connect to the testimonies with new empathy. The testimonies became not only a source of knowledge about events in the past, but a source of courage and resiliency in the present. We recognize today the survivors and rescuers who shared their experiences and the students who chose to learn from and be inspired by them. The fact that students from around the world chose to be part of this year's contest, even during a pandemic, is a tribute to the dedication of their educators. We are honored to have a special message today from Holocaust survivor, Peter Feigl. You will find it hard to believe as you listen to him that Mr. Feigl turned 92 years old just a few days ago. He is alive today because when he needed help the most, there were people who quickly and quietly, as if it were the most natural thing in the world, responded to the needs of this young boy. They gave him a home, they hid and protected him, even when it meant risking their own lives and the lives of their families. Their actions exemplify empathy and courage. And above all, they exemplify a belief in our shared humanity. By participating in this year's contest, you are continuing that legacy of shared strength and humanity. Now it is time to celebrate you, the educators, students, and parents around the world who have participated in this year's contest. Hello. My name is Bill Elperin, and I'm president of the 1939 Society. Almost 80 years ago in Germany, the Nazis took the last step to move their nation from a policy of anti-Semitism to one of genocide. They set out to pursue a goal beyond that of making their homeland racially pure. They determined to eradicate the whole people and the culture of European Jewry. They sought what they called the final solution to what they termed the Jewish problem. Even after the passage of 80 years, the monstrous idea which lies behind those words is almost beyond comprehension. Mankind must learn that the command to remember is important not only to the survivors of the death camps or to the people of Israel or to the Jews. It is an imperative for every civilized people on the face of the earth. We cannot hope for a world in which another Holocaust is unthinkable unless we are prepared to think about the Holocaust 
which the world has already seen. The lessons of history is clear. Freedom is indivisible. Repression begins slowly, usually against those who are few in number, without political power, who somehow seem different. Today, it may be someone you don't know. Tomorrow, someone you don't like. Then suddenly, your neighbor, and then you. That's why we must remember, not only for their sake, but for ours. I want to congratulate each and every one of you for entering this contest and taking the first steps towards remembrance and action. Hopefully, entering this contest and learning about the Holocaust has alerted you to early trends of hatred and bigotry and has fortified you with tools to be used against it. The most important message I can convey to you is don't be a bystander. Be an activist in your own world. Speak out against bullying, against prejudice, and against hatred. Only each of you can make this a better world. Never forget, never again. Thank you, Roger Center for Holocaust Education at Chapman University. Student participants, teachers, and everyone else taking the time to listen to this program. Thank you for inviting me to share with you today my Holocaust survival experience. First, a little background. Following Germany's defeat in World War I, their generals chose to blame others for their defeat and loss of territory while the political leaders sought someone to blame for a collapsing economy with massive unemployment, hyperinflation, starvation, and restitution payments to the war's victors. Shunning responsibility is only too common and easy. Just find a suitable scapegoat. By masterfully spreading fear and propaganda, which included misinformation and lies, Power-hungry politicians rose to power during the 1920s. The consequence was the Nazi party. For the Nazis, the convenient scapegoat were the Jews, who constituted less than 1% of Germany's population and for centuries had been blamed for all of society's problems, from poverty to outbreaks of disease. No doubt you've heard and learned much about the massive atrocities, horrors, and murders perpetrated by the Nazis and their collaborators. By muzzling free speech, silencing the free press, and controlling print, radio, movies, and education, they stirred up latent hatred of Jews. With that history in mind, let me now tell you about my experiences, something that is only possible for me to do because I had the good fortune of encountering good people who did the right thing, if only there had been more of them. As an only child, I was spoiled. My father, Ernst Feigl, born in Vienna, Austria, was a successful mechanical engineer working in Berlin. My mother, Agnes, was born in Germany. Ours was a comfortable upper middle class family of Jewish background. We took vacations at the seashore and sometimes visited Austria where my father's two sisters, Aunt Marianne and Aunt Minnie lived. We were well off by the standards of the time. Dad was always elegantly dressed and loved driving his Mercedes on weekend outings. Mother loved knitting, reading, and listening to music over the radio. Fully integrated into Austro-German society, my father wanted nothing to do with religious practices and mom went along with his wishes. At Christmas time, however, we always had a Christmas tree and Santa brought me presents. Once he even brought me an electric train set. At age six, in public school, my first grade reader was The Poisonous Mushroom, an infamous anti-Semitic children's book that featured a toadstool with a Jewish hooked nose and a six-pointed star on its chest. With the help of this book, the class was taught to hate Jews. We learned that Jews were like vermin, sneaky and dangerous. I was roped in at the time. I did not know that under Nazi laws, I too was considered Jewish, whether my family was religious or not. In 1937, we were living in Vienna and my parents decided to have me baptized so that I would better fit in in Catholic Austria. So at eight, 
I went to catechism, had my, my first communion. As my parents had hoped, their foresight later helped me while I was hiding, trying to avoid capture and deportation to a concentration or death camp. Shortly after my ninth birthday, Germany annexed Austria. When I heard that Hitler was coming to Vienna, I ran from home to see him. I joined in with the crowd and chanted, one people, one empire, one leader. Returning home four hours later, I proudly told my mother, I saw our Führer. And mother slapped me and proclaimed, he is not our Führer. I was stunned. I so much wanted to join the Hitler Youth, wear their uniform, and carry a dagger. Well, ten days later, we left for Belgium, leaving behind all of our possessions, including my electric train set, my scooter. Almost overnight, we went from our lovely, comfortable home to a small, dark, furnished apartment. I had to learn two new languages, French and Flemish, in a new school. I was too young at the time to understand that my parents had given up everything to escape persecution from Nazi anti-Jewish laws. Shortly after my 11th birthday in 1940, Germany attacked Belgium. Dad was arrested as an enemy alien. My mother, grandmother and I fled to France on foot and by hitchhiking. Ten days later, after frequently jumping into ditches to avoid machine gun fire from German dive bombers, we made it to the south of France. There, we were arrested as enemy aliens and sent to the overcrowded girls' detention camp. There were 14,000 prisoners in that camp. Very little food, lots of fleas, bedbugs, and body lice. We slept on the floor. It was hell on earth. After six weeks in detention, a Catholic nun and American Quakers and the Swiss Red Cross helped mother and me settle in Auch, southwestern France. My father, who was in very poor health, also had been sent to girls separately and later was released so we could be reunited as a family. In summer 1942, when I was 13, Jews in France were rounded up. I was in a Quaker summer camp when one day in mid-August, my dad arrived unexpectedly to give me a small pouch to keep. As he left on his bicycle, I had a premonition that I would never see him again. And I cried. I feared for the worst when I looked inside the pouch and found his watch, mother's jewelry, and other keepsakes. I still cherish today the silver good luck horseshoe from my father's car key chain that he gave me that day. And here it is today. On August 27, the camp director, Mrs. Cavaillon, a devout Catholic, who often took me with her to seven o'clock mass, informed me that my parents had been arrested the day before. This news prompted me to start writing a diary addressed to my parents, who I had expected to see again before too long. It was to serve as my connection to them, my only family within reach at that time. Soon after, French police came three different times to arrest me because I was still considered Jewish in spite of my baptism. Mrs. Cavaillon saved me each time by convincing the police that I was seriously ill. Ultimately, I was supposed to be taken out of danger by being included in a Quaker convoy of 500 orphan children going to America in late November 1942. Unbeknownst to me then, my parents were sent from Drancy to the Auschwitz extermination camp on September 4th and killed on arrival two days later. Coincidentally, as I learned decades later, my father's youngest sister, Aunt Marianne, was deported that same week from Vienna to be killed in Minsk in what is now Belarus. The children's convoy to America never did sail because the Germans stopped all ships from leaving France for about my uh, fear about my parents' fate grew as I came to realize that I might be alone in the world. What to do? How would I survive? But the Quakers somehow arranged to send me to Le Chambon, a small French mountain village where some 4,000 villagers, mostly Protestants, 
saved some 4,000 refugees, mostly Jews. The deeply religious villagers whose own ancestors had been persecuted in the late 16th century by the Catholic king were inspired by their pastor, André Trocme, to do the right thing. Here were righteous people who did their best to live by the good book, as they called the Bible. It motivated them to visit the sick and cheer them up, share their food with the hungry, and give shelter to the homeless. And this they did, though in so doing, they risked their own lives and the lives of their families. My diary ends abruptly on arrival there, and it only miraculously resurfaced 45 years later. I stayed in Le Chambon in a, a group home called Crickets with some 24 other children, my only family at the time. Being together with others in the same boat as I gave all of us strength to go on with our lives. In September 1943, at 14, I was given a false French identity and became Pierre Fesson. I was sent to a boarding school in Fijac, where I began my second diary, recording daily for my parents what I was doing in their absence. I so much wanted them to know that I was doing every, everything they expected of me. I also wrote about escaping arrest by hiding 24 hours in the church steeple, sabotaging German vehicles in the school courtyard, and about all the books I was reading. Eventually, to avoid capture, the other Jewish children and I had to flee to an unknown destination. With the help of Jewish underground guides, we made it across the border to Switzerland. In my diary on May 22, 1944, I wrote, I am sleeping safely in a free country. No more fear, even if I didn't know what would, happen, what would come next. That next was reconnecting with my grandmother and aunt Anneli in New York. Joining them in 1946, serving in three years in the US Air Force and catching up on education. I was married for 64 years to Leonie Warschauer, another German Jewish refugee, who gave me two daughters, Joyce and Michelle, and two grandsons, Charles Peter and Alexander. I had a great career in the aircraft industry and served five and a half years in the office of the Secretary of Defense under the administration of President Lyndon Johnson. We retired to Florida in 1990 and moved back north in 2016. My wife Lenny passed away in 2019 and I now live in a retirement community in Maryland. My message to you today is that we are all connected and that our shared humanity requires us to stand up for one another, like the people of Le Chambon did for me. I'm here today thanks to them. So I end today by asking you to do what they did for me. Do the right thing. Thank you for listening to me and uh, congratulations to the prize winners, their proud parents and their teachers. Hi, I'm Jennifer Keene, the Dean of Wilkinson College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences. We are proud to have the Rogers Center of Holocaust Education as a vital part of our college. We are also proud to be part of this contest, which began 22 years ago and now has grown to become truly international in scope. I know that this year has been an exceptionally challenging one for both educators and students. That makes your participation in this year's contest even more remarkable and commendable. Each of you, educators and students alike, deserve special praise for listening to the testimonies of survivors and rescuers, seeking your own meaning in them, and then creating works in prose, poetry, art, and film that reflect both their experiences and yours. Perhaps this year, especially, you have learned that memory can be a source of inspiration and strength. In the next few minutes, you'll see the names of registered middle and high schools from 32 states and 12 countries spanning the world, including Canada, Denmark, Germany, 
India, Mexico, the People's Republic of China, Romania, South Africa, South Korea, Turkey, and the United States. I want to give a special shout out to Poland, which has 13 participating schools, the most we have ever had from any country outside the United States in the history of the contest. Although separated by great distances through this contest, you've come together as a community dedicated to furthering the memory of the Holocaust and to creating a more just, compassionate, and humane world. Today, we celebrate you all.
Congratulations, Violet, on you <clears throat> win. I am glad that my sp story inspired you. The hard time of COVID-19. Hopefully, we will get it over soon. It is so important to make people understand the meaning of family and friends. Thank you for choosing my past for a better future. Thank you. Power of Promise, inspired by Gerda Weissman Klein's testimony. Promise is vulnerable. It is a capacity for greatness, but it is not a guarantee. Gerda Weissman Klein was born into a world bursting with the promise of love, acceptance, and limitless possibility. She lived in Bielsko, Poland with her parents, her brother, and a large extended family who congregated at her home each Sunday. I was taught to love my own religion and tradition, she explains in her video testimony, and to respect everybody else's religion as well. Gerda dreamed of becoming a mother and a writer, and in this atmosphere of love and respect, everything seemed possible. But on September 3rd, 1939, the promise of her childhood was shattered when the Nazis invaded Bielsko. Gerda was 15 years old. As flags with swastikas sprouted from rooftops, she remembers, her relatives fled. Her brother was conscripted for forced labor with the German army, and old friends rejected her. Forced to sell their belongings to survive, Gerda and her parents lived in their basement until 1942, when they entered the Biala ghetto. The life we knew, the life we were a part of, it was all gone, she says. But promise can also be powerful. It is committing, choosing, and doing. That's why, after learning of a family who had committed suicide, Gerda's father made her promise never to surrender to desperation that way. Gerda could not have imagined when she responded, I promise you, that her words would prove to be a lifeline. For one night in the Marsdorf work camp, exhausted, suffering, and lonely, Gerda contemplated jumping in front of a train. Only the memory of her promise and its connection to her father stopped her. From 1942 to 1945, Gerda labored in Bolkenhain, Marsdorf, Landeshut, and Grunberg. Amid the harsh conditions in the camps, there were glimpses of promise, a raspberry from her friend Ilsa, a play performed with the other girls, an SS guard, Frau Kugler, who proved to be one of the most decent people Gerda had ever met. Those glimpses reminded Gerda of her humanity. They affirmed her connection to other people, and that sense of connection gave Gerda the strength to make another important promise. During the death march to Czechoslovakia in 1945, as Ilsa lay dying in her arms, Gerda promised her friend that she would keep going for another week. One week later, Gerda was liberated. It is vital that we uphold the power of promise through connection. This is the message of Gerda's testimony. Today, threatened by an unpredictable virus, we must cooperate to keep each other safe. By doing so, we acknowledge each person's innate promise. We must support those struggling with fear or loss. By doing so, we protect each person's innate promise. We must affirm our connection. By doing so, we nurture each person's innate promise. I will rise to the challenge. It is our responsibility to take care of one another. I will let human connection strengthen and guide me. I promise.
Freedom and Hope based on the testimony of Max Heller. He used to live free from evil until his freedom was taken away by a Nazi uniform. I used to live free from worry and chaos until my freedom was taken away by a virus. Red staining the pavement colored by people he knew and loved. Final breaths filled the air of hospital rooms with people I care about. A loving, warm family helped him push through every day. My friends and family helped me continue to fight day by day. He knew that he had to leave this place of silent horror. I knew that I needed to stay safe from the outside world controlled by the virus. He began his journey to a new place of freedom with no other choice. I had to start adapting to these hopeless times for the sake of humanity. Looking back at his parents, he could only see them getting smaller and smaller. With leaving school and limiting contact, everyone began to get farther and farther away. When he arrived in America, he was scared. He knew that he had to look to memories for comfort. When quarantine started, I had to rely on my past experiences for support. He had to move forward. I have to continue to march. Where was he able to find the freedom he longed for? Where can I find the freedom I wish for? He remembers seeing an American uniform, but this uniform didn't make his palms sweaty. I remember seeing uniforms of doctors, nurses, and scientists. This uniform of freedom didn't make him want to hide. These uniforms give me hope. The person wearing the uniform was welcoming to him. I see the people wear these uniforms trying to change the world. The police officer's friendliness was his first sign of freedom. The first responder's grit was my first sign of hope. Freedom from vile hatred and oppression, hope for a cure.
emotion. Alice Humar's testimony inspired me to reflect on her experience during the Holocaust. To stay alive, it took great inner strength to keep her emotions silenced because she felt she could not afford to be honest. After escaping the ghetto, she was forced to hide in plain sight. Her silence was a matter of life and death. The hand symbolizes how she felt closed in herself. It represents fear, oppression, isolation. Although my COVID experience does not compare, I felt closed in and isolated. I hope one day to inspire others as Alice has done for me. very touched by your film. It is so important for young people to know what happened. And <clears throat> I wish you all a good future and no problems. Thank you again. I was really, really very impressed and touched by your film. I really admire you for doing that. And thanks again, many, many times. My film, We Live for Each Other, shares the story of Holocaust survivor Henry Kress. While in the concentration camp Auschwitz, Henry sustained the will to survive through his connection with his sister, Esther. Simple acts such as passing notes and sharing bread helped Henry keep his humanity alive, especially during this pandemic. We should remember Henry's actions, connect with one another and share our strength. No matter how small the gesture, it can remind us that we are not alone in our struggles. Henry's example taught me the value of sharing connection, especially during the most difficult times. It gave me a new desire to let. Because at least I knew that she is alive. Holocaust survivor Henry Kress's testimony revealed the power of connection. When he was 16, the Gestapo separated him from his parents and brought him to Auschwitz. At this infamous concentration camp, Henry faced daily humiliation, starvation, and physical abuse. Despite all of this, Henry managed to sustain the will to survive through his connection with his sister, Esther. Henry shared how he would stuff slices of bread in his shoes to bring them to his sister. No matter how hungry he was or how risky his actions were, Henry continued to help his sister. Henry also shared a memory of passing notes to his sister in secret. Although these notes only had a few words scratched onto them, the notes were tangible proof that they were both still alive, and that they still had each other. In Auschwitz, when hopelessness overwhelmed Henry, he would think about his family. During the miserable days and terrifying nights, Henry would choose what to hold in his mind. He would recall the warmth and joy of family gatherings on Hanukkah and the Sabbath. Daydreaming about better days didn't erase the horror of Auschwitz, but thinking of his sister and the rest of his family helped him envision a happier future. Although this pandemic is vastly different from the Holocaust, the burden of isolation that many of us feel has created pessimism and despair. What many of us miss are the daily connections to our friends at school or colleagues at work. When we feel alone, we can remember how Henry remained connected during the Holocaust. Sometimes we can't change the external conditions that limit or frighten us, but we can choose our response. 
Henry risked everything to remain connected to his sister, the surviving member of his family. In our own lives, we can rely on our family, friends, and neighbors to help us through challenging times. Although physical connection is not possible, we have found new ways to connect through phone calls, emails, and written communication. It is in these small and meaningful connections that we are truly able to follow Henry's example of the internal strength that he retained during the Holocaust. Every moment at Auschwitz that Henry and Esther shared lifted their spirits in a way that only human connection can, no matter how small. Especially during these times, it's important to understand that we are not alone. We must reach out for that small connection that can inspire strength and hope. And I was concerned that if I don't survive, that she will not survive because we live for each other. Olivia, your film has special meaning to me. My father, Henry Kress, lived through unspeakable times. Henry regained hope and a willingness to survive, knowing that his sister was alive and that he might be able to reconnect with her one day. If my father were here, he would be beaming with pride that his story resonated with you and that you so beautifully crafted your personal statement about our need for human connection. Olivia, thank you again for sharing this wonderful story with us and congratulations to all the winners. It is an important contribution to the Holocaust Remembrance Program and it should serve as an inspiration for all of us. Thank you, Dr. Heron and Chapman University for making such a heartfelt program available to its students and to all those wishing to participate.
Inspired by Francis Simon's testimony, Alone but together. Alone but together. Hurt together, hope together, heal together. Night. Uncertainty concealed in darkness. A rumor became a mass genocide. Unaware residents underestimated the Nazis, believing they were safe in the ghetto from dangers outside. Awakened in the night, Frances found herself boarding an unknown train to an unknown destination. The doors closed. There was only darkness. Spring. New life bringing new beginnings. A rumor became a deadly pandemic. Unaware, I underestimated the virus. Inside the house became safe from dangers outside. Awakened by the engine roaring, I waved goodbye as my dad departed for the hospital. The garage closed and the car drove off. Spring brought sorrow. Hurt together. Auschwitz, few outlasted death. Those words, woman to the right, men to the left, divided families. Separated from everyone and chosen to work, things took a turn for the worse. Supper brought news of her mother sent to the crematorium. She was alone in a dehumanizing nightmare. COVID-19, war against an invisible enemy. Those words, we've tested positive, divided us. Two quarantine upstairs, one in the hospital, things took a turn for the worse. April 2nd brought the hardest news. My father was gone. It all seemed unreal. No possible revenge, for he was taken by a merciless assassin. Hope together. Decency, rarely found during the Holocaust. Air once filled with lively conversations was replaced with the thick perfume of burning corpses. Fellow inmates brought comfort. She was no longer alone. Frances took it upon herself to help others survive because her parents taught her to be giving. So she, among few, showed decency. Time waits for nobody. Air once filled with laughter was replaced with infectious coughs. My sister brought hope and comfort. I was not alone. I was motivated to stay strong so she did not have to carry the burden. There was no time to mourn. Life continued on. Heal together. Compassion, strength for today. Marching aimlessly towards death, despair overwhelmed Frances and her companions. But compassion from a superior, given in the form of food and rest, gave a renewed hope for the future. A future built on the foundation of compassion. Community, hope for tomorrow. With the coming of my father's death, I had become emotionally unstable and stressed with responsibilities. But my friends and family came together to show sympathy and support, encouraging us to remain strong in a time of despair. Community brought hope into our lives. A seemingly eternal winter has settled over our world. Just as the Nazis infiltrated Jewish communities, now more than ever, our communities perish. Despite these hardships, we must learn to share. Share past stories, for history rhymes. Share strength, there is strength in numbers. Share our stories. We may not be the first to walk this path, but we will certainly not be the last. As loneliness begins to reside in our lives, we must remember to share. For when we share, no matter how alone, we unite together. No season lasts in eternity, alone but together.
Hello, my name is Angelina Biloa. I'm a Holocaust survivor. I want to thank you. I'm very, very touched for the, <clears throat> the uh, artwork you did. And my husband would be thrilled to see that. And it's amazing how you do that. I'm really very grateful. And I'm sure my husband would be very grateful to My artwork is titled Perseverance. In Esther Stern's testimony, she mentioned how she and her two younger sisters had to march in horrible freezing weather conditions without any warm clothes. They were able to sustain their humanity through this trek by holding each other close for warmth. In this piece, I wanted to emphasize the warmth and strength they shared through their family connection, which allowed them to persevere through the death march and all the terrible events of the Holocaust they endured. My family's presence and support sustain me now during the worldwide pandemic. Hello, Noel. I'm Renee Firestone, and I am a Holocaust survivor. I want to congratulate you in the wonderful film you made based on my story, on my life story as a Holocaust survivor. I'm so proud uh, of you and what you accomplished. Everyone should see this film and that they should learn about the Holocaust. Wishing you a very, very success in your future, in our future. worthwhile surviving. We are currently experiencing some hard times, but with support from our friends and families, we can make it through. I chose Henry Nussbaum's words because he reminds us that something beautiful is waiting for us. Surviving the nightmare of the Holocaust made him realize that the effort to stay strong was worth it, and he advises us to also stay strong. In this video, I try to help him send this message to others. Day 340 of the pandemic. Today feels like yesterday and the day before yesterday. I am making myself a cup of tea and I continue my book about the Holocaust. Now I am reading the story about Henry Nussbaum, a very brave man who survived that there will hell. He was born and raised in Poland. He went through a lot. He stole food and goods, he was arrested, beaten up, but he kept helping others as much as possible, like others helped him. He never gave up. He never lost hope. And, uh, it was something that I didn't want to look back, just running away from Sodom and Gomorrah, sort of. Just run forward, run, run away from where you were. Go someplace, and we are running, really running. 
I see a lot of similarities between us and the people who are trying to survive the Holocaust. We all are or were hiding from something that could kill us, the virus or the Nazis. The fear is keeping us all captive. It's true that our generation is not as tortured as those people were, but in both situations we killed millions of innocent souls. The freedom is desired just as much. Henry thinks that along with others, he can help the world avoid experiencing another holocaust. He believes that we must support one another. We have to remember in these hard times that despite, despite all, all the, the horrors, horrors there, there is something, something in us positive, positive that made us look forward, made us see that there is still a world to live for and to live in. With all the horrible things, uh, I now think that it is worthwhile surviving. Hi. On behalf of President Strupa and Chapman University, I want to offer my congratulations to the finalists, the first and second place recipients, and to all the students and teachers who participated in this year's contest. Today, thanks to all of you, even though we can't be together in person, we are very much a special community. This contest speaks to our values as a university, as a place where the generations come together and learn from one another, and as an institution that affirms the power of memory in shaping our future and guiding the decisions we make in our lives today. This has been a year of challenges and loss. Loss of people we care about and loss of the opportunity to be in a classroom and to socialize with our extended family and our friends. That is why this year's theme, sharing strength sustaining humanity is not only about the Holocaust, but about the choices we make today to be there for one another. I hope that next year we'll be able to welcome those of you who live locally back to our campus, even as we continue to expand our virtual community around the world. Thanks to all of you for making the special effort it took to participate in this year's contest. And when you get around to applying to college, please remember Chapman University. Thank you.